So we we'll look at Psalms chapter 1 this morning. And just a reminder, if you want to read the book of Psalms over the course of this summer, if you read two a day, about six days a week, uh, you'll get through the whole book of Psalms over the course of the summer. And uh, it'll be enjoyable to spend the summer in the Psalms. The Psalms are, uh, they're songs of worship, really. I mean, we look at them and we look at the type of language, we look at the, the way the verses are set up, and they're, they're songs to be sung, they're poetry. The truth is you could look at Psalms as kind of a playlist of temple worship's greatest hits, or it might be more accurate to say it's five separate playlists because the book of Psalms itself is divided into five books. The first two tell the story of David and his family. The third is themed around the, the tragedy of Israel's exile and the downfall of David's line. Books four and five are about the hope for a Messiah and a new temple in the future kingdom of God after the people's exile. One of the really interesting things about Psalms is it's divided into five books. And for the, the Jewish people of that time, that would have, it would have immediately reminded them that, hey, uh, the law, the books of Moses also number five books. And so it was, it was meant to draw that comparison. These were songs uh, to be sung in worship, along with the law that God had uh, given them. The Psalms were collected for use in worship, but they were written by several authors. Uh, according to the, the inscriptions, David wrote 73 Psalms, Asaph wrote 12, the sons of Korah wrote nine. Solomon wrote two. Heman, uh, Ethan, and Moses each wrote one. And there are 51 Psalms that are anonymous. We don't know. It doesn't say who wrote them. Here's another fact. Psalms is the most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So as you look through the New Testament, you will find Psalms quoted more often than uh, any other book of the Bible. In fact, Jesus quoted Psalms more often than any other book. Jesus also confirmed the importance of Psalms um, as scripture. In Luke 24, 44, uh, Jesus said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses the prophets and the Psalms uh, must be fulfilled. So Jesus put the, he called the the, uh, the Psalms scripture. He put them on the same level as the prophets and the books of Moses that we find in the Old Testament. Uh, these were, the Psalms were, were songs that Jesus was very well uh, acquainted with. One of the things that we should remember when reading the Psalms is that the Psalms contain intimate cries of the human heart. And just like us, the Psalmists, their hearts cried out at times in joy, sometimes in tragedy, sometimes in sorrow, sometimes in doubt, and sometimes in hope. And those are all the same human cries that we still have when we look for God. The truth is we walk, we live in this fallen world. And there are times when our, our hearts cry out to God and the Psalms reveal very honest prayers uh, to the Father. For us, the patterns of prayer give us permission to be honest with God about what we're feeling. In this world, we will experience joy and sorrow, tragedy and hope, doubt and confusion, and yet through it all, God is with us. He is present in our lives, and he offers us a path of hope towards our Savior. This week, we'll begin with the, the very first psalm. Uh, in fact, the first two psalms really serve as an introduction to the book of Psalms. 
Psalm 1 is about finding a real joy, a truer, deeper happiness, something that comes not from our external experiences in this world, but something that comes from God speaking to our hearts. Here's an interesting question. What is it that really makes people happy? Research shows that the, the top three things that make people happy are one, close relationships, two, purpose or meaningful work, and three, hope, a positive outlook. It shouldn't really be a secret. It shouldn't really be a surprise. Close relationships, purpose, and hope. Those are the things that give us uh, the deepest sense of joy in this world. It's what we were created for, in fact, and it's exactly what we find in a relationship with God. So let's go ahead and read uh, the first psalm together. Psalm 1. I happen to be reading from the, the CED, but uh, the truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice doesn't stand on the road of sinners and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. Instead of doing these things, these persons love the Lord's instruction and they recite God's instruction day and night. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water which bears fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. That's not true for the wicked. They are like dust that the wind blows away. And that's why the wicked will have no standing in the court of justice, neither will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked is destroyed. True happiness, that's what everyone's looking for. And people look for it so often in the wrong places. People look for happiness in accumulating wealth. They look for it in accumulating political power. They look, at, they look for happiness by seeking affirmation from others. Sometimes they look for happiness by uh, chasing highs and pleasures in self-destructive ways. But the thing is, wealth can be lost, power can corrupt. The value of affirmation depends on who it comes from, and pleasure is fleeting. All of these things are temporary. True happiness, real joy, is found at the intersection of relationship, purpose, and hope. And that's exactly where we find Jesus. There's only two roads through this world. There's the way of God, and there's the other way. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, there's only two roads. The one we follow, follow Jesus down or the one that leads to destruction. In verse 6, it says that the Lord is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is destroyed. The way of the Lord. It's like this. Ultimately, we were created to love and be loved by God. And part of loving God is loving those he loves, which means each other. There's no human being on this planet that God doesn't love. He may not always like everything they do, but he loves them and he desires a relationship with them. And he desires to see them following a path that leads to him in true joy. And the truth is it. He gives us the freedom to choose. He's not looking for robots who have to do what he wants. He's looking for people that love him and follow him because they love him. We can seek a path that leads towards him. Uh, for Israel, God gave them the, the five books of the law, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. And the law was intended to clarify for the people Two roads, God's way and the other way. In the law, we see, we see a pattern of God giving the Israelites rules, and then they break them. And he gives them more rules, and then they break them. 
And at the end of his life, Moses spoke about these two roads. And he spoke about them in terms of blessings, blessings and curses. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, verse 19, Moses said, I call heaven and earth as my witnesses against you right now. I have set before you, or I have set uh, life and death, blessing and, cur and curse before you. Now choose life so that you and your descendants will live. Moses also sort of looked prophetically into the future in De Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, when he says, Then the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, so that you love the Lord your God with all your mind and with all your being, in order that you might live. What he said isn't a whole lot different than, than what Jesus said. He was, Jesus said he was the way, he was the truth, he was life. Jesus came to fulfill the law so that not only might those who repent be forgiven, but their hearts, their minds might be changed in such a way that they are able to love God with their whole being and to love others just as they love themselves. In other words, Jesus came so that we might be en en enabled to follow the road of God by our love for him and our love for those he loves. There's only one other road. There's only two choices. We can follow God or not. In the scripture, it talks about the way of destruction, the way that leads to destruction. The road to destruction is simply the road of self. It's the road that says, what do I want? <clears throat> the road of destruction is kind of like the, the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. There's only two roads, it's God's way and my way. The road to destruction says, I'll live by my law, by my choices, by my desires. I'll serve myself. I will essentially live as though I am the king and know best. C.S. Lewis uh, described the people of these two roads when he said, there's two kinds of people in the world, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. One is the road of defiant joy in spite of our struggles, and the other is a road of struggle in spite of fleeting moments of something like joy. True happiness, real joy, is not found in the advice of the wicked. The advice of the wicked is the, the voices that say, do what feels good, follow your nature, be true to yourself. Real joy isn't found on the road of the sinful and disrespectful, the psalmist says. Despite what the world says, the way we live matters to God. In Matthew 15, verse 19, Jesus said, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defiles a person. And in Romans 2, uh, excuse me, Romans 12, 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. The followers of Jesus aren't meant to be conformed to the patterns of this world. We're meant to be conformed to the mind of Christ and to follow him in obedience. Because the truth is, there's only two ways. There's God's way and there's the other way. And a life without God is like, is like dust that blows away in the wind. Life on the road of destruction is, is fleeting. It's temporary. It's here today and gone tomorrow. But Jesus has given, a, given us a path to God that leads to eternal life. It leads to true joy, happiness, true happiness. Something that's not fleeting is found on the path of Jesus. In, our, in this first psalm, verse 2 says that to love the Lord's instruction uh, and recite it day and night. Love the Lord's instruction and recite it day and night. Maybe that's where we get the idea from that, 
We should read our Bible, our Bible regularly so that we know the written word, so that we can come to know the living word. True happiness or joy is found in getting to know the God who's revealed in our Bible. The joyful love the Lord's instruction. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In Romans 15.4, it says, Whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we can have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. And so the psalmist says, Recite it day and night. The truth is, if we really want to get to know God, read, listen, talk about the written word. The Bible is, it's, it's revelation in the sense that it is the revealing of God to people. Perhaps the only word of caution when it comes to the Bible we need is, we don't worship the Bible. Uh, instead, we worship and get to know the God who is revealed in the Bible. That's why uh, sometimes we talk about the Bible as the Word of God, but it's really the written Word of God because in the Gospel of John, we're reminded that Jesus is the Word of God. He is the, the living Word. He is uh, God Almighty in the flesh. Don't read the Bible as a rule book. It's, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. Read the Bible as the story of God and his love for his people. Because that's what it really is. From the beginning when we see God create human beings and then we see them fall. To him uh, guide, choosing a people for himself and guiding them. Trying to give them laws and rules for their own uh, for their own benefit that would draw them closer to him and yet again and again they struggle and they break them we simply showed what we needed wasn't a rule book what we needed was a savior and so the bible continues to tell the story of how god became flesh and blood and dwelt among us laid down his life as a sacrifice for our sins rose from the grave triumphantly and offers us eternal life in him. The Bible is the story of God and his people. It's, it reveals everything we need to know to have a relationship with Jesus. The God of the Bible is ultimately revealed in the living word, Jesus. In Romans 12, uh, 2, it says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. In Titus 2.14, it says Jesus gave himself for us in order to rescue us from every kind of lawless behavior and cleanse a special people for himself who are eager to do good. That verse reminds me that the, the purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection it went beyond just forgiveness. Its purpose was transformation of the heart. Verse 3 of the, the first psalm is beautiful. It says, those who follow the path of God are like a tree replanted by streams of water, which bears fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. I would, I would imagine that verse is where uh, a line from an old hymn comes from. There's an old hymn that says, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. When we plant our lives in Jesus, we are like a tree replanted by the water. When we keep our eyes on following Jesus down the road of life, we're like that tree, solid and firm, planted by the living water, and our thirst would continually be quenched and restored. 
and we will bear fruit as we live a life that makes an eternal difference. We'll be like a tree planted by the water whose leaves don't fade. Jesus has promised us eternal life. We live in a fallen, sin-scarred world and there's only two paths we can follow. One will bring real, deep-down joy, even in the midst of our brokenness. And the other will leave us broken, even in the midst of fleeting attempts to find happiness. We have a choice set before us. We can choose the road of God, or we can choose to go our own way. Every time I, I think of God in those terms, I... I often think back to a point in my own life where I remember praying, God, I'm trying to do things my way. And I felt the Holy Spirit just saying, how is that working for you? <laughs> there's God's way and there's the other way. I want to be like a tree planted by the water. A tree solid in its foundation in Jesus. A tree that bears fruit. A tree that's always got plentiful, a plentiful supply of water from the living water. And a tree who, whose leaves will never fall, who finds eternal life in Jesus. When we put it in those terms of it's two roads, it's really not much of a choice, and yet God does give us a choice. I would encourage you to choose life. We're going to sing last songs, one last song as we close together. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift his face to you and grant you peace. God bless you and enjoy our afternoon.